Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Control Board Podcast, episode 327, I think. I think that's right. My name's Benjamin Yoder, and I'm here today from the future talking to you. Uh, if you don't know, I am out this weekend, so I'm pre-recording an episode a bit in advance. Actually, the last episode you heard, I'm recording uh, uh, after this one. So if there's no news stories for me to talk about, uh, I probably talked about Final Fantasy 11, but, um, but I'll, 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 I hope you enjoyed that. I guess you'll know by this point, whether, whether, how well, that went down. Uh, but this week I wanted to, uh, go ahead and talk about a couple different things. One is I went to a, um, uh, arcade, played some arcade stuff. So I thought that'd be some fun stuff to run through. And then also I just want to give you some general feelings on my PlayStation VR experience and also give a rundown of Farpoint and how I felt about that, which if you don't know, Farpoint's a shooter on PSVR. So very PSVR heavy week this week for the most part, maybe a shorter episode. I'm skipping and questioning this week. I'm just, I'm a little lazy tonight. So <laughs> we'll, we'll come back with a question afterwards, um, on the next, next show. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I thought we'd do that. Um, one quick thing. Thing I just want to note here real quick is that uh, things happened and uh, my AC is in a weird state right now. It's working at this moment, but will not be working uh, in the morning by the time I'm reading this. So I have it on and just running like full blast and hope to get as much coldness out of it before uh, the, the, the morning comes. So I'm going to leave it on for this show. I do haven't recorded with my AC on a long time, so I don't know that's gonna how that's gonna affect the audio quality. But just wanted to give you a heads up that is there. So if I sound a little funny this week, that's probably why. So um, one thing I did want to follow up on here real quick as well. Actually, not not gonna say that for for the podcast you already heard. So I'm gonna hold off that. <laughs> Let's just jump into arcade game. So uh, yeah, I went down to a uh, local arcade. I think it's called like um, Velocity Esports. Uh, I think that sounds right. It's a uh, arcade here in Las Vegas, and if you don't know, this used to be the Game Works. And I stepped in there a while ago um, and kind of looked around and generally felt like it was not in great shape and the game selection was not amazing. Um, and I think generally I feel it that way this time, uh, although I feel like the machines were generally working, the ones that I played, so that was kind of nice. But um, it does feel kind of like a cheaper uh kind of round one dave and busters alternative kind of thing right i say cheaper because i think it might literally be cheaper it felt like the the money i put into my card went a lot longer than the money i'd put in my card at a round one or something like that but you're not going there and getting like you know a bunch of like fighting games and and you know uh like what's a rhythm games and things like that like, you know tattoo connect or whatever it's called you're not getting that kind of stuff you're getting the more traditional dave and busters experience when it comes to that stuff i actually had a card that was like a free hour of play time but apparently it was only for the esports lounge not for the arcade and i was very disappointed so <laughs> uh so yeah um, but there's a handful of different games I played. Some of these I played a lot more than others, and I'll have more thoughts on them, although we'll probably get through most of these pretty quick. Um, the first one's called Dead Heat, which is like a Namco racing game. Um, it is a realistic style racer, so, uh, when I was looking at it, I was like, Namco making that. I mean, I don't know how many racing franchises Namco has done that are more realistic style, um, but obviously I immediately made the association with Ridge Racer, so I was like, yeah, sure, I'll try out whatever this thing is. You know, I don't know if it's just Namco published or if Namco developed, but it definitely felt like it had that Ridge Racer flavor and just in terms of how the cars move a bit. I'm not saying the drifting is accurate to Ridge Racer per se, but I felt like it was a very similar experience of just like, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to spend this entire race uh, basically spinning out of control. <laughs> and I felt like that was the experience I had. Uh, I think it was a little bit more generous just to like try to keep you moving forward versus like, I remember playing Ridge Racer 6's demo or 5, whatever's on PS3. I played a demo for a Ridge Racer game, and I remember just, like, spending the whole race just, like, doing almost complete 360s on accident. Um, where the case of this game, I think I feel like you didn't really have the problem where you do a bunch of complete 360s, but it was just, like, very easy to just, like, kind of wobble off course and and end up in a wall. Uh, but it never felt like you were, like, completely out of whack and moving to the side, so... Um, I, th I just thought it was interesting that it did remind me so much of Ridge Racer. I don't know what year this game was, um, but uh, it is kind of interesting that it include the Ridge Racer name on there. Not that I necessarily know if the Ridge Racer name is a powerful brand these days. I don't know when the win last Ridge Racer game was other than PlayStation Vita. And I seem to recall that a lot of the last Ridge Racer games maybe were kind of like enhanced versions of past Ridge Racer games. I could be wrong. I've only ever played Ridge Racer on the DS. I also have Ridge Racer 64 and a couple of... Um, 
other Ridge Racers on PlayStation as well. So I have a lot of older Ridge Racers, not many new ones, which is probably a mistake because I think at this point, my feeling is I'd rather play a new Ridge Racer, not an older one. So whoops, that's what you get, Ben. Uh, I had dreams for uh, what I was going to try to do with that stuff and then ended up not doing it. So that's what happens when you uh, buy stuff trying to make a video and then realize, actually, I don't want to make this video. And instead, you get the Asphalt Urban Urban GT video because I think that's a better video. (laughs) So uh, again, that's on the OCP Plus channel if you want to go check that out over there where I talk about Asphalt GT. In my opinion, the superior game to Ridge Racer DS. But they're also trying to do different things. So, So yeah. Um, I played a more like traditional, maybe carnival game kind of thing. I don't know if carnival game is the right thing. It, it, the presentation was nice of it. It's a game called Basketball Pro. I don't know if I've ever seen something like this before. I would not be surprised if I played something like this when I was a kid and just don't remember it. But it was like one of those basket shooting games. You know, you always see them in the corner of every arcade. Uh, but instead of throwing the balls that like are physically thrown at you, you have a plastic basketball that's like on the front of the machine itself. Or maybe plastic maybe is not the best term. Eh, I guess plastic, not a hard plastic. It, it basically is kind of like pressing down like on a actual basketball to some extent. It doesn't feel like one, but that's ge- general idea of like a deflated basketball you can push into. And when you push into the basketball, there's little basketballs in the inside that are like over top of these holes. And you can use those um, the, the, the basketball to push up those balls and then try to knock them into the hoops and things like that, which I thought was like a fun thing. I, I basically what I found to be the best strategy for this is <laughs> like the CPR method where I put like two hands down and kind of lean over and just kind of like push into it like I'm doing you know chest compressions or something like that I felt like that was like the best way to do it uh for me at least so um so that was like a cute fun little thing I I kind of like those more carnival gamey kind of things sometimes if they have like some novelty to it if it's like the standard stuff like I wouldn't usually just play the basketball hoops game thing on my own um but like I mean in certain situations I definitely would uh depending on who I was with and what we were doing but um, it, it, it's not something I would like normally play on my own. Or something like this. This was like a fun little thing just to play. I did play it with my my dad, but um, you know, I, I think I would have checked it out either way for that. Um, there's another like kind of carnival game kind of thing, but it seemed like maybe like a low budget arcade game is maybe the better way to put it. I think it's called like Super Bonus Win Robin Hood, um, which is basically just a like single screen shooter, as far as I can tell. Um, where it basically has a screen and there's these like these targets that go across it and like treasure chests and stuff like that. And you have a crossbow that you can kind of tilt and aim and use as like, I don't know if you're using it as a light gun or if it's just like reading the tilt and aim from like you moving the, the crossbow itself on that little pivot thing. Um, but, uh, it wasn't anything to write home about, but I thought I'd mention it since I played it because you basically just shoot stuff to try to get a high score. I'm guessing it was probably a ticket game. I mean, that basketball pro thing was a ticket game as well. I'm sure. But it just felt more um, just like, hey, here's a quick little fun experience. And also you're going to get like 20 tickets or something like that was probably a little more in line. The game I probably spent the most time with was Terminator Salvation. I think that's the name of it. It's an arcade on-rail shooter game in the Terminator franchise. If you don't know, I have never watched a Terminator thing. I've never played a Terminator game. So this is my first Terminator experience. Um, and yeah, it was kind of interesting actually, because it does take, it plays a lot with the power of whatever hardware is in there. It feels like, and it was like, Hey, we're just going to have like this very chaotic, like war scene essentially with the Terminators. So there's a lot of times where you're just like shooting into waves and waves and waves of these Terminator guys. I always thought there's just like one Terminator, but apparently there's many of these Terminators. <laughs> um, but, um, and so like you're shooting through waves and waves of them kind of thing. And um, I think what's kind of neat about it is I think it's very generous and how it lets the player manage the enemies on screen because it doesn't always come down to just killing something as soon as possible. A lot of times it comes down to just shooting it enough to stun it. And so you can kind of like bounce around a little bit from different enemies and stuff like that. And, um, you know, if you didn't kill them, that's that's fine. You still interrupted their shot kind of thing. And I, I kind of appreciated that. And a lot of the weapons, like the shotguns and machine guns, often felt more like they were, they were better at... Um, 
well, the shotguns in particular were better at just like crowd canceling a lot, like crowd stunning things. I mean, they definitely did damage as well, but crowd stunning things are definitely the the benefit of it kind of thing. So um, we played through the first episode, I think is what it is, which I think is like four chapters. And I think there's a second episode and we did not finish that, but I actually really enjoyed that. I thought it was like, at least the machine I was playing on seemed very reasonable in terms of, you know, credit spending. It didn't seem too cheap. It's not like there's almost always ways to... Um, to uh d- you know prevent whatever's happening there's maybe like a couple things i could think of otherwise and i don't know if like shooting your teammates really mattered or not they would put an x up on screen but i will say if it does matter um y- because it's like a big war at least that first episode it's really hard to not shoot your teammates i will say so um maybe maybe a- a under pro play wouldn't be a thing but my first time playing it was definitely like oh my gosh and they definitely play with that a lot because there's like a mission where you're like in this little pool of water and these like these robot snakes or are uh, robot terminators or, or snake terminators i don't know are going around in the water and you're like uh, allies are being kind of like tossed about in the water as well with you and so generally you want to try to avoid shooting them and things like that so but yeah i never saw like if there's an actual like downside to that as well in the last two games i went i went down to the roots i played wicked tuna and uh big buck hd wild <laughs> um <laughs> Wicked Tuna was interesting. It was like this fishing game controller, like you have a big, big fishing rod kind of thing. You have to press like basically a series of buttons to um to like lock in the fish you're going to be pulling. And it seems like it's mostly competitive, or at least the mode we played were, was competitive. Um, and you have to like sit there and reel in the um the uh spool on the uh fishing rod like a fishing rod right but they are big fishing rods so i felt like reeling in the spool was actually really challenging at times because i had a hard time finding like the right hand motion that would like let me do the full circles um with how big it was versus like a smaller reel kind of thing right um but it seemed kind of cute it definitely felt like it was i don't know i don't know who made it i wouldn't be surprised if it was just the big buck hunter people because it definitely felt like that um and and but i think it was like a fairly fun game for what it was a very short game as well which i which was nice and then big book hd is really just an opportunity for me to also talk about the fact that like i feel like every time i go to the arcade my dad i've been playing big buck hunter recently not a lot we just play like one round but man big buck hunter is a there is it's interesting um because it is just like one of those things that you assume you'd go in and just like shoot stuff right But a lot of times it's like you need to shoot these animals in a very particular way, which I mean, I think is a very hunting specific thing as well. I say as somebody who's never hunted, like, like make sure you're shooting these enemies in a very specific way to get the best score. Right. Because I assume it's like, hey, this is the one that like retains the the body form of the animal the best or like, you know, doesn't like like gets like kills them without rupturing too many of their organs and things like that i would imagine i don't know don't ask me about hunting (laughs) but but uh a lot of that kind of stuff but then there's also like animals on the screen that you don't really want to shoot kind of thing so they kind of like run in front and um get in the way a lot of times and things like that and there's like dangerous hunts which is like when a predator comes on screen you got to sit there and like blast them a ton and like it's all single shot like hunting rifles so you get like pump it every single time you shoot kind of thing so um i will say that those games all feel almost exactly the same every big buck hunter machine i have put my hands on feels like just big buck hunter so if you ask me what big buck hunter hd wild is versus any other big buck hunter game i played the only thing i could probably really point to are the bonus games because occasionally it's like hey go into the factory and shoot all the booze bottles or go into i think in this case it was like there's a bunch of eels on this sunken ship electric eel shoot them before they electrocute you kind of thing so um, it, it, it seemed to be mostly differentiated by the bonus content for as far as I can tell. But hey, if you're a big buck hunter fan, uh, let me know your big buck hunter experience and like what makes each big buck hunter unique. Is there a best big buck hunter game? Let me know. <laughs> Anyways. So yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, you know, I think it's a totally okay arcade game. Um, the fact that it did feel cheaper at the very least, you know, is at least one encouraging sign. If you want to play those more like Dave and Buster style games, I think it like worked out pretty well. Um, but obviously you're not going to get like the more like interesting titles that a round one would have kind of thing. Right. I haven't been to game nest in a while. I probably should go back at some point to just check in. Last time I visited with them, I felt like the variety wasn't as much as I'd like, but they still had like a lot of interesting things in there. 
I probably didn't spend a lot of time on most things, though, I will say. But anyways, always fun to just kind of talk about, you know, various little arcade games. Obviously, I don't play like a lot of them long term or anything like that. But that's just the nature of the American arcade market, unless you're playing Minecraft Dungeons, where you get printable cards. I think I can't remember if they had a Minecraft Dungeons machine there. I don't recall seeing one, but but if I did, that'd probably be like one of the more affordable places for me to actually go to play that stuff. So so, yeah. Anyways, uh, like I said, I'm going to skip the question this week just because I'm, I'm feeling a little tired and antsy after a uh, long day of work and then AC trouble. So, <laughs> so going to skip out on the other on the other stuff for now. But um, yeah, um, we're going to. Oh, but yeah, thank you so much to uh, both uh, 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 my brain. Uh, <laughs> Jillian, there we go. That's the word I'm looking for. Jillian and Fireweed. Thank you guys again for supporting me this month. I appreciate that. Um, I think if if Fireweed, if I did not answer your question, I saw you answered a question. I didn't reply to you. I should do that. Um, if I if I answered your question last week, I hope it went well. Um, if I did not answer your question last week, I'll answer it next week. <laughs> so I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about my general PSVR experience now for the rest of the show. Um, you know, I, I, I have talked about this a little bit, so I think there's going to be a little overlap because it is, uh, you know, fairly recent, but I thought it'd be good to talk about, you know, given the me finishing up Farpoint, which is my first real VR game. But, um, yeah, I mean, the PSVR is a platform that so far, if you don't know, I picked it up in Japan for like anywhere between like 50 to 70 bucks, something like that. Um, I think it was like maybe like a little under 50 for just the headset. And then I had to buy a camera and some move controllers and things like that. And I think that might've put me up closer to like 70 or something like that, which I mean, I needed some move. I needed, I don't have any PlayStation move controllers, but I do have some PlayStation move games that were gifted to me. So it is something that I've been meaning to get to anyways. Right. Um, so I have not used the PlayStation move controller though at all because, uh, Farpoint does not use it. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, yeah, so I, I, I've been kind of happy with it overall, but I only am really happy with it at the price point it's at, I think, right. That price point, I think if it was any more than a hundred dollars, you start getting dangerously close into this needs to fulfill the role of a console. Right. So especially when you start looking at modern day PS4 head. PS uh, or, or VR headsets when you're looking at spending 300 400 500 600 dollars on a headset right um that at that point you are investing in an ecosystem in the way you're investing into a console inco- ecosystem right um where with this price point it felt a lot more in the realm of like silly little PS4 controller that I can mess with and I think that's really helped with my expectations of you know the PSVR is just not a great looking uh but i mean it, like the outside the design is really nice but like the headset itself is just not like great looking in terms of the resolution it definitely you can definitely tell it's just like pretty blurry on the inside and um you know there's just more limitations from the tracking with the camera and stuff like that instead of like inside out tracking or something like that but you know it was, it was a fairly early headset at a budget price already right so it's not maybe too too terribly surprising but it does feel like something that i think works a lot more as like a companion piece to your ps4 rather than paying full price like another ps4 kind of thing but on the bright side sony seemed to invested like a decent amount of money into the software library of it and i think at the time there's enough companies that were interested in vr that you kind of had a lot of companies take at least one type of swing at the platform right like namco did summer lesson um you know you have uh uh you know uh, sega with space channel 5 in there right like like or whatever company it is that that push that for i don't know if it's sega actually because sega like doesn't care about those ip usually but um you know there's there's a lot of like little things here and there there's that from software game things like that there's a bunch of like there's like the million arthur vr rpg thing which i I don't think is anything crazy so there's like a lot of like interesting little projects and so like as a fun bonus controller i think those interesting little projects make a lot of sense right and i'm not looking for these full experiences and because the reality is is that like with psvr um I generally have found that like while the headset is very comfortable to wear, um, it is something that like it starts to feel stuffy at some point when you're wearing it long term. Right. And so I feel like it's pretty rare. I want to be spending more than I'd say two to three hours inside a headset. Once the three hour mark is hit, I'm kind of ready to take it off. 
So, um, you know, which I mean is like, it's not a short gaming session by any means. Don't get me wrong. But I think at that point I start feeling like I really just want to take this thing off now just because it, it like, you know, it gets sweaty and like you have stuff pressing against your face and things like that. But the PSVR, I think, is very uh, um, nice and, 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 and adjustable. And I, I really do think like even though I complain about the resolution, a lot of times it feels like as long as things are within a certain range, I can kind of gloss it over with my brain and not worry about the the visual quality as much. And I think because of the resolution with how it's at, it doesn't matter right now if I wear glasses or not in the headset because, well, I do use glasses, especially for looking at things far, far away. Um, I found that my vision is is about at range of what the PSVR's like resolution shows without glasses. So I think it ultimately was like good for me to not have to use glasses where if it's a more clear, uh, you know, higher resolution, I think not wearing glasses would be more noticeable. And so I'd have to figure out like how to wear glasses while I'm playing or, you know, potentially invest in prescription contact lenses, which I can't imagine is like a cheap thing to do these days. I, I'd imagine most companies doing that at this point are specialized in, in that process now because I don't think there's a lot of people messing with it. Although I don't know like how many people play like VR chat every day. I'd be kind of curious about that. So, um, but yeah, I've been generally happy with it. I have not used the PlayStation Move controllers with it yet, so I can't really speak to that. Um, but so far, the tracking has generally been pretty good. The only time I've really had any issue with tracking is if I left the lights on and um, and I have in my room this like uh, standing lamp that has the bulbs facing outwards. If you ever saw old streams, you probably saw it where the bulbs are very apparent. And that definitely shows up my camera in the current spot it's at. So I think the PlayStation VR has a hard time differentiating between those those glowing bulbs and the VR or the PlayStation Move um, bulb on the front of it as well. So. Um, so turning off my lights, I think it has been really helpful, but you know, obviously when you have the headset on, if you're living alone, that's not really a big deal, right? Um, it like, doesn't really matter if you have lights on when you're, when your headset's on. So, um, and you know, it's definitely very noticeable, the viewing range on the PSVR, it's very constrained, but again, like at some point, if you, once you're engaged enough with the game, at least for myself, it doesn't really bother me that much. But I say this to somebody who like, you know, when I'm playing like Arkwright's Fantasia on the Wii, right? I'm playing it at 480p, but within moments, my brain smooths that over. Like, even if it is, like, pure straight digital output, no CRT filters, no nothing, right? Like, my brain just solves that problem on its own after, like, five to ten minutes. Um, and and so, I think it does a lot of the same thing for PlayStation VR, although I'll talk a little bit about Farpoint and some of the struggles I had with that as well. So, um, before we get into Farpoint, I did try to try, try to try, uh, two PSVR experiences. However, both of them I ran into issues with. One was 100-foot ro robot golf. I bought that f to play with a friend, um, and apparently there is no online mode or VR support for online mode. I don't know why that's the case, but apparently that's the case. So um, we did play a lot of regular 100-foot robot golf, and as a multiplayer game at the very least, was not particularly impressed, but it sounds like from what other people were telling me, the single players where that game really shines, if at all. Um, I saw Destructoid gave it like a 4 out of 10, and then they did the pun of 4 out of 10, right? And then I also tried to play the PSVR Playroom stuff. Um, but when I looked into it, I saw that the playroom stuff is it basically intended to have somebody on the couch with the controller while you are wearing the headset with your head the headphones out kind of thing. And so I think there's like one or two single player things in there that I read, but I just kind of didn't bother to boot it up. I, it's one of those things that like if it wasn't a VR thing, I probably would boot it up and just try it, right? But because VR is the process of, okay, I got to go take off things. Oh, here's one thing that's a pain about PSVR as well. I don't know what it is, if it's my hair or whatever, but every single time I put my PSVR on, there are smudges on the lenses. Obviously, I'm not shoving my thumbs in there and touching the lenses or whatever. So my best guess is that, like, when I'm taking the headset off, like, my hair is, like, gross from the sweat and stuff, and then, like, it rubs up on there when it comes off. Um, so maybe, I don't know, shave your head. <laughs> um, um, I just need to remember to clean them off ahead of time and just see if that's what it is. Because if I clean them off ahead of time and then come back and they're smudged again, then maybe it's more of putting them on later is the problem. But I think it's when you're taking them off, the, the, your hair with like the oils and sweats and stuff like that can get on there. And, and so we'll go ahead and smudge that up. But if you, again, if you don't have any hair, 
then that might actually work out better for you in, in that particular case. So, but yeah, it's just a little slightly inconvenient to set up the PSVR headset. So like, it's not as easy as I'd like sometimes, but on the, on the other side of things though, like with my setup and my room, like it's been a long time since I've talked about my capture setup, but like there's always some process I have to do to play a game. So it's not that much worse than that. And on the bright side, I don't have to like switch it to TV mode. I actually do have problems with the uh, PlayStation VR. There's like a little box that, that is like between the uh, PSVR and the PS4 and your TV. Um, and it basically, I think it's like an additional processing unit or something like that. that they put back package separately, but your PS4 runs through that. And something about that device does not like handshaking with the rest of my chain. So I've had to struggle with that a little bit. But, you know, that's my own nightmarish capture setup uh, problem. So I do want to say, though, in this moment, I know everyone's probably generally okay with HDMI. Good Lord, do I hate HDMI. I really wish we went with a different format that was not HDMI. I think I heard it's called like SS. Is it SHD or something like that? There's like this cable that was like an, a competitor that is actually used, but it's only used in like um, uh, enterprise settings. Um, and it is apparently does not have a lot of the problems that HDMI has. And so I'm jealous, but you know, nothing is made to work with anything other than HDMI at this point. So rest in peace. Anyways, those are just my general thoughts on the headset itself overall, though. I think it's just very comfortable. It has a lot of limitations, but for the price it was at the time, it makes sense for the price it is today makes a ton of sense. So, uh, but the first game I played on this uh, was Farpoint, which I've talked a little bit about on the podcast in the past. Uh, this is uh, basically like a VR um, first-person shooter, but it's not just like a shooting gallery. It is like a full like shooter you can kind of walk around with and shoot. Uh, it's very linear in a lot of ways, so it definitely isn't like some big expansive thing. But you know, it's about like three to four hours story. Um, kind of thing. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of the Nintendo Wii and I love playing shooters on the Nintendo Wii. So when you're playing a shooter with or the Farpoint on PSVR, um, it feels very similar when you're using the PSVR aim controller, which is basically the gun controller um, that the PSVR has, where it basically takes a move controller nub and puts it on the front of a gun casing kind of thing. And then uh, you have buttons on the controller as well. So it works really well for like, you know, matching to like the in-world guns and things like that. So I feel like, I think it feels pretty good to use. Uh, the design is maybe a little, a little thicker than I would like to some extent, but it's nothing so bad that I couldn't get used to it. Although I was playing with a friend for the multiplayer part of it and he did have some trouble with the grip, just kind of hurting his hand a little bit. Um, but I think part of it's like, as long as you kind of adjust your, your grip on certain parts of the controller, um, you'll, you'll, you'll get to a place that feels comfortable. Uh, the biggest challenge I think with that controller specifically is that it's very easy to touch buttons that you didn't mean to touch because you cannot see those buttons when you're in the VR headset. So if you're looking to press, uh, like L2 and you press L1 instead, then, you know, you'll like, that can be the difference between scanning something and firing a grenade at the thing that you're trying to scan and killing yourself kind of thing is basically um, what that means. But yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, it plays very similar to a Wii game, but there's, there's kind of some key differences that we'll get into. But um, yeah, so I mean, to, 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 to kind of describe what Farpoint is as a whole, like it's a weird kind of, I don't know, weird's probably not the best word. It's a sci-fi, I'd say fairly budget shooter um, it, it feels a lot like, I always think of like the conduit on the Wii, um, where it has this, this a fairly decent rounded amount of guns. You have the guns that are kind of the tried and true ones that are like, you know, an assault rifle, a sniper rifle, although it's more like a, a, a bolt action rifle maybe is the better thing. Cause it doesn't have a scope on a scopeless sniper, um, you know, shotgun. And then also you have like alien guns as well. So it's like a plasma rifle that can like spit out a shield. And there's also like a spike launcher that like jabs in spikes and then you can like explode them on enemies and things like that. Um, and, and I, I kind of actually like how a lot of these budget shooters tend to handle this because I feel like they're, they're, con well, they're, weapons are typically more limited in terms of the number of them um they often feel more balanced in a game like halo i feel like alien weapons feel terrible most of the time so like this game i think generally finds a good balance in regards to those kind of guns but it's like a neat sci-fi kind of game so you get that kind of like sci-fi gun kind of kind of element to it and i first played it through multiplayer so my experience of the game was fairly limited initially because it's basically like a few hours of non-story co-op missions but the bigger thing is in the multiplayer is that um while you can find guns in the world 
uh, and you can level them up. You can actually get them higher rank. You don't actually get the choice to start with certain guns or change out to different alt variations of guns until you beat the story itself. So um, the story is basically this kind of like dimensional jump gate game kind of thing you like you, you kind of like are at the space station and like a warp portal opens up and people get sucked into it basically including yourself and um so you are all on this like you know planet that nobody knows what it is and it has a very like survival horror feel to it actually early on because you're you are alone um you're trying to find your crewmates basically and so it it plays you know like something where they they really want to tease you for each enemy type that shows up. So like maybe 10 or so enemy types and each one has like a fairly dramatic or, or sometimes fairly subtle entrance, right? Like the very first enemy you see in the game is a tiny spider that can attack you, but like it doesn't really engage with you initially. It just kind of like walks across the wall. Which is, I mean, a very common trick kind of thing, right? But I think it works really well here. And, um, you know, I did try to kind of like, in some ways because of the immersion and also because I'm trying to be better about this kind of stuff, um, give myself up to what the tone of the game is trying to accomplish, right? So in this situation, it was trying to be more like antsy, anxious, in some ways, horror-ish kind of um, game. So I try to lean into that. I tried to be cautious, you know, when going around and things like that. And that definitely kind of like amped up the beginning of the game's feeling and made it feel a bit more relatable, even though the reality is, having played the multiplayer, I knew you could just run through and just shoot things like a gun and kill stuff pretty quick. So um, the game does eventually get really uh, um, busy later. And like, I will say, even though it starts off fairly slow and fairly kind of like, um, um, you know, limited in terms of the combat, um, the game has like a great mix of enemies. And the last third of the game is really this kind of, um, I'd say, I don't know if the like dramatic scale is the right word, but it is a fairly expansive feeling combat scenario that feels greater than just you. Um, but there's a good mix of enemy types. There's enemies that are just more like the little dumb insect types, and there's actual characters with guns and things like that that will shoot at you and things like that. So I think it's like a good mix of of types of enemies uh, across from you so like like as much as i call this like a budget game in a lot of ways i feel like they put the budget in all the right places when it came to the gameplay aspect and that's like what makes it really solid there's really nothing wrong about how the game plays mechanically it just feels like they just made a really solid vr shooter and and made it work and because you're able to move you know, freely, essentially, you know, for someone like me who wants to have an experience that's a bit more than just like, you know, being an on-rail shooter in VR, I think that's like a really satisfying thing to do. And it's, it's nice to be able to do things like really get up on cover and things like that. And really like with the VR headset on, feel like you're in that little nook and cranny with the sniper rifle, like not propped up on the rock, obviously, but like going over the rock and like, it, there's something really satisfying about that feeling of just like looking past cover and, and, and shooting things and things like that. So my biggest problem though is, is probably nothing to do with the game itself. Well, it maybe I should, maybe it's not that nothing to do with the game itself. Cause obviously they designed the game in a particular way, even though they knew the hardware's limitations, but um, the resolution, um, as I mentioned earlier, mid range, Perfectly fine. I feel perfectly good with mid-range resolution. It's easy for my brain to trick myself into not caring about, you know, the blurriness and, and stuff like that. But this game does a lot of uh, far away combat. So, you know, enemies will be on the horizon and it's very hard to, at times to pick them out from just like rocks and stuff. And like, it is like a Mars looking kind of game. And the enemies are very like bland looking aliens and, and insects and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to pick stuff out. So I think those are the things they could have done to design the game around the limitations of the PS4 VR, but you know, it definitely, you can feel it when you're trying to sit there and use like the rifle to hit something that's far away and just feel like, I can't tell if I'm pointing at this thing. Now, some the sniper rifles in particular, or the rifles, I say scopeless rifles in particular, do typically have an indicator that will tell you if you are um, hovering over something, but it feels more like a Band-Aid than it feels like a solution. I think there's probably other ways they probably could have um, um, probably better handled that resolution issue, um, even if it just means keeping things in mid-range combat kind of thing. Um, 
the other thing that was not gameplay oriented, but was, I think, something that took you out of the experience was there is text that appears in certain elements of the game. So you're sitting there, you're holding your gun, you can look up, bring your gun up to your face and there's like engravings on there because it was manufactured or something like that. Or like in your home base, there's like post-it notes and things like that. And and the post-it notes are like just far away enough you can't read them. Like there's a couple you can get kind of close to and you can tell that they're written in English text and you can read them. But, like, it just feels like some of the things about the game were just designed with, like, hey, look at this cool thing. But then you realize, oh, the PSVR doesn't really let you look at this cool thing. It's very hard to tell what it looks like. And I think those are the elements of the games that probably take you out of the experience the most. And I think they probably should have honestly scrapped that kind of stuff to focus more on the space in between that probably works um, better overall. But still very, like, again, that's like a, a minor complaint. And a lot of that, I think, comes from the PSVR itself. But all this is kind of wrapped together in this story, um, and the story's interesting as well in VR. Again, at my first VR experience, um, you kind of play this faceless Marine guy who is completely unremarkable, unfortunately. I, I was a little sad that he was just kind of no, a nobody and like didn't feel very important. But the uh, the main story is following your your, your previous companions. Uh, you know, basically they left data logs behind, and uh, you basically are following their life story of how they cope with uh, being trapped in space, right? And um, while you, and I mean, initially they're on your same mission of just trying to find a way out of there. But in some ways they kind of come to terms with like, that's just not going to happen probably. Like they're they're open to it, but they are like, we just need to like try to make this work as is. And so it's a really interesting kind of um, experience where even though it's like this kind of alien space game, it's a lot more on the relationship of these two characters. The story gets kind of weird at some point, I will say. Not so much, maybe weird isn't the right word, but it kind of moves quick at some point. And it actually changes with like the ga- the pacing of the game gets incredibly quick as well at that time. But the story just doesn't really feel like it it, it, it survives the change in pace. It kind of feels like a story that ends before you get to the end of the game. You know, you you basically get through most of these character stories and then you kind of at the end are are left doing something that is kind of in some ways unrelated um, to what what was happening. Like there's some connections here and there, but it really doesn't matter that much. So um, but but it is an interesting thing because you do have these cutscenes where you are in the head of people who are not the main character. So you're switching bodies through these cutscenes sometimes. And so you are sitting in this character's body um, and a character across from you is emoting at you, right? And when you move in real life, your character in game is reacting to that movement. And there's this kind of strange, like, almost like disconnect that I think happens where you are sitting there stone cold staring at this person in the face as they're emoting at them. And your character is talking, but you are not emoting. You're just standing there, which, you know, obviously is a very common thing in in games. But I think in the VR space and in that immersion space, it's very awkward and odd looking to be sitting there and have a character hang on a like line and not to be able to see the body language of your character and how they react because they don't always use verbal cues it definitely is using silence to say something but because you are sitting there with no body language beyond what you do yourself it, it's this very odd experience so I, I did at some point points try the idea like of maybe moving my character that in a way that felt a little more natural to what the character was trying to do right like when a character is like, hey, look up at the stars or something like that. Like, yeah, don't just like look up the stars real quick. Like do kind of like look at the stars and like spend time looking at the stars, right? And like, it's nothing particularly impressive, but like it's good to like, I think continue to like look down and like engage visually with that character and then try to follow. In some ways, like it's almost like trying to tell a story through line of sight, right? You're trying to play a character through through how you're looking at this world And how you, what you're looking at, helping you fill in the blanks of like what your character is trying to do. It's interesting. It made me think a lot about like old visual novel protagonists or like the dark eye cover kind of things where they don't really look like, you know, a person because they are kind of intended for self insertion. And like as somebody who's never really related to that, um, this is like probably the closest experience I've had where I felt like the need to like put myself in this role 
in some ways. But I will say that's hard to do when it's a character that's already so well-defined and it feels awkward and odd. Um, and, and I don't necessarily think it is a, it's interesting to look at, but I don't think it's necessarily, necessarily like a good thing about this game. So I, 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 I hesitate to say that this game is like makes effective use of VR for storytelling. I don't think it really does, but it does create some interesting questions where you're in VR and you're having this story cutscene play out in you, in front of you. And how does that change your expectations as the player to react to that? And again, this is my first VR experience. So this is my first time having to ask this question. And this game just happened to be the one in front of me. So maybe other games have this weird problem as well. But it just makes it a little awkward. So, but yeah, it's an, it's, it's interesting at the very least. So, um, but yeah, I think overall though, I think if 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 this were like a Wii game, it'd be like a solid average release, right? For me and so the vr definitely adds novelty to it but um it's not something that i think is um particularly stand out and unique i think the biggest thing for me is just that the the gunplay really solid the um the the um you know i think guns themselves were really good and i think the pacing of the game even though a little slow initially um really picks up in a way that i think changes how you interact with that game because unlike a Wii game where you are using the Wii remote pointer you don't have as much urgency with where you're looking because of how the bounding box works in that game where you have to move the Wii remote around to turn the screen in the case of um of something like Farpoint in VR your head is that camera and the gun follows you right based off how you move it so so there's a lot more ability to, i feel like to feel flexible in how you move around that world so it definitely feels like an improvement over like what a wii version of this game so i'm not saying it's just like just compare it a little to a wii game kind of thing but i i think it is it's a good kind of an initial thought point if you've never really thought about uh these kind of games and what they can offer to you so anyways far point Pretty nice. I liked it. Um, I got a little sick at some points. I will say, like, uh, probably the the key times I got sick were when I was not sitting up straight and playing. Um, I think something about laying back and moving in the game was not particularly great. Um, also, when I first started playing, I did have this kind of weird feeling when I would get close to tables because I think I was sitting down but moving towards a table, and so my body didn't really expect the table to be as high as it was. Um, or maybe I should say a counter kind of thing. So, uh, because my character was standing, even though I was sitting down and, uh, and then, yeah, sometimes I just felt a little queasy afterwards as well, but like, it was never like bad enough that I like it interrupted my play sessions or anything like anything like that. It usually just like, it's something I felt after I took the headset off, but it definitely feels like you have to kind of like rev down from playing a game like that. Um, so I'm looking forward to playing some more VR stuff. You know, 100 Foot Robot Golf is the only other game I have at the moment. And um, I'll have to play that single player. I think it's like three to five hours. So like, you know, probably two sessions, something like that, if I decide to do that. Um, But I will say the multiplayer for Robot Golf, 100 Foot Robot Golf, did not give me a lot of confidence in it in gamepad mode. So we'll see what happens. But anyways, that's going to be it for this week. Thank you again for coming. We'll probably talk about PAX next week. Does that make sense? Yeah, PAX. I probably should have talked about PAX this episode, but I'm not, I'm not going to be in town long enough to feel comfortable recording episodes. So you're going to hear about PAX next week and then also uh, maybe a retro game computer convention if I have, or a retro computer convention if I have anything to say about that. But honestly, I feel like I'm going to show up there and go, wow, computer. And that's going to be all that I'm going to have to say about that. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll see how, how that all goes and stuff. But um yeah, I haven't recorded last week's episode yet, but uh, hopefully it's interesting. Hopefully hopefully there's more than just Final Fantasy XI in there, but I have a feeling it's a lot of Final Fantasy XI talks. So I hope I hope you enjoyed that. And this week we get a lot of VR talks. So at least, you know, Final Fantasy XI VR next week. Uh, I actually have no idea what we'll be talking about next week, but um, uh, hopefully something interesting, hopefully something cool. Um, but I'll be back home and ready to calm down from my travel travel time. So... Anyways, thank you guys for coming. OneTour.com is, is the website. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that because I don't really know what's coming up and what's 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 out around this time. So I hope you guys have a great week, though. Bye.